Navy Photo World. Welcome back to another episode here on TakingTalkPics.com. This is another episode from the former podcast. Please subscribe, hit that notification bell, and join the email list. Let's get to that 1,000 subscriber marker so that way I can add a new video every single week. Enjoy. Hey Photo World, thanks for being here, and I know you love taking talk pics, but I know there's more on iTunes to take a look at than just our podcast. Head over to takingtalkpics.com where you'll have an opportunity to win an iTunes gift card. Just enter your name and email and hit the subscribe button, and you will be automatically entered for our weekly drawing for that iTunes gift card. Good luck. I take a lot of notes. My, I, my iPad goes everywhere, my iPod goes everywhere, and I'm constantly putting stuff in to check out. So. Welcome, Photo World, to Take and Talk Picks. This is Episode 7. I'm your host, Rob Kruger, and thank you for tuning in. Today's featured guest is Michael Barton. His company is Michael Barton Art. Michael is a frequently published photographer, with his artwork being featured in the Professional Photographers of America headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia, the International Loan Collection Spotlight on multiple occasions, as well as the International Photographic Competition Loan Collection book for seven consecutive years, as well as many other publications throughout North America and beyond. Michael, welcome to Take and Talk Picks. Introduce yourself and give us an overview of your business. I have a studio out in Tibby, Illinois, for people that are listening out of state. So we're local, but not everyone else is. So <laughs> in in that regard, you know, I started out as a, a wedding photographer, portrait photographer, whatnot. And these days I'm doing, I, I guess, a, a lower volume of things. I do a great deal of teaching. But on top of that, I do, you know, art pieces uh, commissions and really relatively slow portraiture for people. And uh, that's a bit hard to explain, but I guess I'm a little bit more of a detail freak and follow a bit more the the traditions of uh, photographers that are, I guess, long, long gone these days, really. I, I kind of got that idea in your, your black and white prints on your website, uh, showing some of that specifically. Michael, uh, here for Photo World listening and just on Take and Talk Picks, we're all about sharing stories. So invite us in on these occasions and let us know how they apply to your life or what you learn along the way. And we can be right there with you, uh, learning and kind of living that experience with you. But to start us off, I just want to kind of get the inspiration flowing. And I've kind of broken it down into some sort of inspiration being a mantra or a quote. Do you have something that you live by? Uh, sure. It's an interesting question. I guess I can break it down into one sentence and I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, but my background's in music and I started playing piano when I was four and went all the way through, uh, through my master's degree. And one thing I've learned, and I guess if there's something I'm living by these days is that uh, photography and art are actually performance art. So I think of photography as performance art, and that has a very, very strong impact on composition, technique, and how I approach the rhythm, and I mean, even the way I, I re interact with my subjects. That's awesome. I love it. I've never heard that connection there, that it'd be a performance art. And I come from a family of musicians. You'd think I'd get there, but uh, that's, that's a really cool approach. And just thinking about it, I mean, photo world, look at your friends, look at yourself when you're shooting Look at what you're doing. You know, you're performing on the street there. Yeah, that all makes sense and it clicks for me. I like it. Well, and then to that point, you know, just to kind of not to interrupt you, but to no, it's fine. Kind of put in on there, and I, I can't give you a, a direct quotation, but as uh, some of your listeners may know, maybe not, but Ansel Adams, it's no big secret, but if you study Ansel Adams, he was a concert pianist. Mm -hmm. And a lot of quotations that he has, a lot of his teaching came from that performance background. What is uh, particularly interesting about that is there was a quotation that I'd never heard before, and I believe it was his book, The Camera, of course, of the, the camera, the print, and the negative, or whatever order you put those in. And he was talking about choosing different formats, alluding to something. And again, I can't give you a direct quotation, wish I could. But every time you change formats, it changes the way you approach your craft. So, for example, when you shoot 35 millimeter, you photograph one way, 4 by 5 is another, and so forth and so on. 
And that is uh, fairly intuitive. It's not like that's earth shattering to hear that. However, grabbing a pinhole camera, grabbing even something like a Holga or another Lomo camera or something lo-fi really changes your approach, makes you take a few extra breaths and um, kind of shifts your perception. And in a lot of ways, that's like picking a musical instrument. Every guitar is a different personality, every piano, everything else. And so I'm making this a bit longer, but something is simple as using a film camera these days and film is is somewhat i don't know i guess i'll use the word irrelevant though some people are going to take exception to that and you know with response to anyone that takes exception to that i'm, I'm shooting it so i guess i'm irrelevant too <laughs> but at, at some level, it's it's like playing a synthesizer these days. There is some brilliant keyboards out there that can play. You know, you can have a hundred pianos plus on your laptop that you can play on your fingertips these days using using keyboards. However, there's something very different about sitting down and playing a 13 foot Steinway, and it changes the way you play. It changes the right. notes you choose, and so forth. So. Well, I mean, it comes down to just the details of it, the pressure of the keys that it takes or doesn't, you know, from a keyboard to, you know, getting to that grand piano, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, the feel is different every time and you're going to react differently to that. Um, I could talk music for a while, but we're going to try to get back to photography because I'm just going to fight the temptation, but definitely keep it connected because I love how it does flow for you, your life and your business. But what sparked your interest in photography enough to pursue it as a career? Given your segue, it's hard for me to, to avoid the music. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. Go for it. Go for it. You know, strangely enough, when I, I finished my, my master's degree in music, I was a, uh, a full-time musician, was doing all that. And uh, photography kind of came in when I was looking at old uh, old magazines, uh, old books, doing a lot of research in the library in, in graduate school and just fell in love with uh, Herman Leonard, uh, well, his photography rather, but uh, all, all sorts of different things. And there's a whole genre of art that is based on music, especially jazz music, which is specifically what I studied. And in studying jazz, you run across this photography. It is everywhere. You have William Claxton and so forth and so on. I could drop names till, uh, geez, till, till noon, but we won't do that. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, pursuing that made me want to have a camera in my hands and made me really want to capture that culture. So one of the first subjects I migrated toward uh, obviously, we're, we're musicians. So photographing my friends, photographing, documenting when I was in the studio, um, the music studio, that is, rather, mm -hmm. and, and documenting, you know, things, uh, travels, being on the road, um, which is not nearly as glamorous as, as a lot of people make it out to be, I'm, I'm fairly certain. So from there, I never really walked away from music. I still play, and I'm actually playing quite a bit more these days than I have even in the last decade. But photography was just this natural byproduct that it kept growing and growing and growing. And, you know, like pretty much anybody else, anyone that's listening or whatever, uh, you know, it was, it was a hobby that more or less got out of control. And after a while, I mean... Uh, you know, with, with you being a wedding shooter, I think you can understand this is just to be very, very blunt. People start throwing money your way and you take it. That that's kind of where, where it came from before is I was playing at weddings and I, I didn't play a lot of weddings with music. I had the, uh, the, the fortune of doing some other stuff at, at a younger age. But, you know, you go to a wedding and let's just say you're a musician making 250 bucks to, to play a wedding. And, of course, there's musicians listening to this thinking, I wish <laughs> <laughs> some people get paid less than that or whatever. But yeah. you're looking over at the, uh, at the DJ and he's pulling in a grand. You're looking over at the photographer. He's making more than that, he or she. And then you're thinking to yourself, well, OK. <laughs> <laughs> So it kind of it kind of took off from there, and you know, the, the more I shot, the the more I realized that I had um, this gift, rather that uh, that that I was able to to, to create with a camera, and it kind of it kind of spun from there, and I found myself studying and studying and studying. I, I guess that's where it took me today was just trying to find every piece of information I could find and put it to work. I love it. That's a great journey. One step into the next. And I, I like where it kind of just started by seeing what's going on in your own craft to the jazz music. As we go through our journey, you or I or anybody out there listening, we have problems along the way. You know, we start to realize, yeah, you know, there's some money out there to be made. We can do what we love. 
But it's a business and that becomes difficult for a lot of people. And in a business especially, we learn some things the hard way. We have a time where we fail. Something didn't go the way we planned or it didn't work out. Communication error happened or something got in the way. Can you think of a time when you had to learn the hard way in your photography business? I think we could talk about that longer than (laughs) we could talk about my uh, jazz photography list. (laughs) Man, yeah, I, I've learned. I mean, I when I came into this, it was uh, it was baptism by fire. I I went from being a hobbyist. I mean, I literally owned a camera for about a year and a half before I was a full time photographer. Wow, owned a camera. <laughs> I never I never. That's owned. fast. Yeah, it went really really fast. Even just from little things like not having enough flashcards to not having enough film to handling the film wrong. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. And, and I guess uh, to to spin this into a positive is I had a lot of opportunities early on hold reflectors to be mentored, to be doing things like that. And this may sound a little bit preachy, but to flip it over on a positive side is one thing I was able to do was make a lot of mistakes under someone else, which sounds kind of callous, like I got to mess up someone else's business. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) They know what they're getting into when you ask to help for free. Right. Well, and and, and a lot of that I did even even professionally as an assistant. So I I had a, a period of apprenticing and whatnot. If there's an overarching mistake that I can say that I made is I probably could have spent more time shooting, you know, with someone else's business before I opened my own. At the same time, if I hadn't made those mistakes, I, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. You know, a- along the way, it's kind of like growing up. We have to make those mistakes. We have to do it because we're not going to learn any other way, just like anything else. And I realize that's a cliche. And again, I'm not saying anything new here. But it, at some point as a photographer, we need to be, you know, we need to fall down a flight of stairs, hopefully figuratively speaking. Yeah, not with all that gear. Right. So, so I don't really have necessarily, I mean, again, I've got a, a billion specific things in there. I, I guess I have no regrets in that regard. I think uh framed it well for us, realizing that, you know what, if you're going to make mistakes, do it under somebody else. I liked that uh, because you kind of see them also making mistakes and you can learn from their failures and successes to kind of see what you would like to implement into your business or not, or your photography. There's less pressure. You know, you're not the one with the client. You're not the one with the responsibility. Right. And I think at any level, if you're wondering about what else to do, go look to other people and try to join them a little bit. See if you can shadow them on a shoot, hang out, you know, just get to know, network a little bit. So uh, you kind of you kind of stirred something in here. And I was photographing a wedding. I believe this was longer than seven years ago, but I was photographing a wedding and we were uh, at this enormous park. And, and when we were photographing, we took the wedding party out there. And when I mean large, it had all these different roads that wound its way through the, the trees and, and the, the I guess the forest or something like that. And so we're back there, found this really cool spot. We're photographing. Everyone gets in the car. They're all leaving and I'm the last one to leave. And I of course, I reach into my pocket and I don't have the compact flash card. When I say I don't have the compact flash card, I believe this was before I was photographing raw. So I had all the pre-wedding shots, the ceremony shots, the post-ceremony shots and everything else on this card and I didn't have it. And so I spent about a half an hour looking and looking and looking. And I guess the only way I can really describe this is I can't remember praying that much in my life and I can't remember swearing that much in my life. So it was it was an interesting combination. So I, I kept looking and looking and looking and looking and looking. And a half an hour, I, I found it on a little piece of mulch in this rather large area, just sitting right there. And what's funny is I went to the reception and I was late. I missed the introductions. I missed whatever. And needless to say, the uh, the bride's father was not very happy with me. Uh, nor should he have been. I mean, I would have been I would have been livid. So I grabbed the card, clenched in my fingers. I'm, I was looking about as um, well about as bad as I looked this time of uh, this this time of day seeing as I, I woke up shortly ago but so I walk in the bride's father is giving me the, this really dirty look but it, his face changed when he saw the look on my face the bride came over and she'd got my phone message said no it's okay it's okay it's okay do, you know do you have the card I said yes she's like oh thank God go eat you know go eat go sit down whatever <laughs> you missed it you know who cares you've got the card right what's really interesting is I looked at her and I said well can I back the card up first and of course that was 
more than okay with her. But what the interesting part of the story is a couple years ago, her sister called me and said she was getting married and wanted me to photograph it. And of course, I'm thinking, what? <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, what is what is wrong with you? I mean, different things went through my mind, and <laughs> and it was right. it was very uh, it, it short circuited me. And finally, I said, "You realize what a gargantuan mistake I made, right? That 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 is. I mean, it was unforgivable what I had done. I mean, I I lost sleep for weeks over that. You know, and I'd torn my car to shreds, done whatever. And she said, "Well, look, anyone that cares that much about my sister's wedding and her photographs is." is the guy that I want photographing mine. It, it serves so many things. So the, the very negative lesson, of course, was that I needed compact flash card holders. So right. to have a wallet in there to not keep things in my pocket, right? A, a, right. Duct tape them to your chest. Or, just make sure they don't right. leave you. <laughs> to, to back my cards up, to do whatever, uh, to make sure that, that I protect those cards beyond a shadow of a doubt. But the very positive thing, realizing that as photographers, we're going to make a lot of mistakes. You know, sometimes it takes something that, I don't know, I mean, uh, just I'll, I'll just use the word stupid. That's stupid and that horrendous <laughs> on my part. To, to realize uh, now, granted, I, I would much rather not book anything by means of such, but there you go. Yeah, for sure. Maybe having a card is the answer to this one, but what would you consider the most important practice to your photography? Is there one piece in your workflow that you can't go without? Light meter. Having a light meter, and I guess part two of that would be, uh, or, or one A, is to have good lights and consistent exposures. And however you go about getting consistent exposures is paramount, because essentially I don't have to do any work after a session to correct anything if it's not broken to begin with. And not that I'm saying that I'm a purist and I won't massage exposures or do things like that, of course. And traditional photographers that were in the dark room like to preach that, and yet they would spend three weeks working on one negative that they messed up and not tell anybody. But yeah, having a light meter going through there, being able to do something as simple as synchronizing the settings of my images together is right. huge. That saves me more time than I can express. Photo world, if you don't think you need a light meter, then that's the one tool that lets you know how it works. So just follow it, trust it. It's there for a reason. Michael, we have a wide range of photographers listening. I was just wondering if you could share with Photo World one thing that you believe can lead to growth and success in a photography business. Just something you've learned along the way. Two words, pay attention. If we want to learn lighting, granted there are some visually impaired people, but I'm assuming they're not listening to this because <laughs> uh, uh, blind people don't make very good photographers. They, they have certainly have gifts elsewhere, but um, I haven't yet met a blind photographer though. There's, there's one out there, fair enough. So I will keep that. But uh, barring that, brains when we're born, we see light everywhere. That's one of the first sensations we see when we're coming out. Obviously, I don't remember it and you probably don't either but oh i totally <laughs> you no. we were born <laughs> but uh you know we're born seeing light and searching for light and our brains that's how we function that's how we eat that's how we walk that's how we not run our cars and the things and so forth so what's interesting is a lot of people want to learn lighting and they go through great means to to study and they should and they should study this and whatnot and a lot of people want to know how to make things look natural well it's not necessarily gear it's not necessarily this and all the those things are fabulous. We spend a lot of time talking about the light meter, of course. But mm -hmm. to learn natural light, just open your eyes everywhere we look. And we spend so right. much time trying to create things that are already in front of us and trying to learn things that we already know. And so a lot of it is just coupling our knowledge with our intuition. I couldn't have said it better myself. I love that. Pay attention. Get out there. Pay attention to everything. It's around you. I don't know about you, Michael, but I find when I'm talking to someone, you know, face to face, I'll move to make sure they can turn just a little bit to get that, you know, Rembrandt lighting happening or whatever's going on, or just to fix the background. I'm, I'm watching my scenery, my frame at all times, and I can't help it. It's so annoying, um, but I kind of love it. If you're stuck in that mode of paying attention, you're always going to be looking for that picture. So that way, when you actually go to photograph, you're that more prepared, that much more prepared for it. Yeah, right. So, you know, pay attention. Well, you know, it's other things. Photography went through an age where everything was very, very composed, where you had a lot of your uh, traditional instructors, traditional photographers, 
you know, especially if you go back uh, even a decade ago, you had some very well constructed photographs. And it's not to be very, very fair stylistically. It's not completely my thing, but I, I do have a lot of respect for it. These days, it's come mm -hmm. around full circle where a lot of people are just shooting environmental shots or, uh, quote, relational photography, which, again, has no regard for anything uh, in the way of posing and whatnot. Now, at the same time, people use the expression, well, once you know the rules, you can break them. I right. hate that expression. <laughs> I hate that expression because there are no rules. The principles that we're using and the principles for portraiture are based on what we see and, again, based on intuition. So if you look at our body language when we talk to each other, you look at the body language as how we sit, how we position ourselves, and so forth and so on, that's a foundation for posing people, for doing portraiture, for doing all those things that are around us. Well, that's great. Michael, can you share with Photo World a time where you had an aha moment during your career, that spark of inspiration, knowing, you know, this is it, this is what I need to do next? One of the aha moments that came through, and if you were to ask me this tomorrow, I'd give you a completely different answer. And I, I don't think that's what's wrong. I think that's what's right. In regard to that, my craft, all of our craft, again, there are no rules. And I think there's a positive side to that. There's a negative side to that. The negative side is when people are just throwing stuff around and seeing what sticks and, and whatnot. And I don't I don't have a lot of respect for that. I'll just be I'll just be really, really blunt. But the aha moment, uh, one of them was to consider that when we photograph, we're photographing using a vocabulary. What I mean by that in music, you have vocabulary where if you're playing jazz, there's certain ways of playing certain different embellishments, syncopations, things like that, that fall into the genre. And it is very much like mm -hmm. having a conversation. It, we're talking now in English. And if you started talking in French, I would dare say I'd probably be lost pretty quick. Hence being vocabulary, correct? When we have fluency, we can have a conversation without really thinking about it. We, we have a higher level of thinking. We don't have to think about each word, each whatever. And with photography, I think that is where it really resonates with me and still re or resonated rather and still resonates in the fact that, yeah, there are no quote rules, but at the same time, we still have to tap into people's experience. We still have to tap into a vocabulary some common things that we have as human beings. And I think having compassion, really loving what we do, but also taking the time to do something as simple as learning the words, learning our camera, learning our craft, learning what's around us. Although intuitively speaking, we have the knowledge around us, it is something quite different to learn how to express that. And if you've ever been around a kid, I don't know if you have kids, but I have a daughter. My daughter didn't come into this world speaking. It took a very, very long time. She's nine and she's still learning how to spell. She's still learning how to do all that. And it takes decades. There's people that have doctorates in language that still haven't learned the entire English language. In regard to that, I think that there's a certain amount of ignorance, I guess I'll use that term. I'm, I'm trying not to, to, to throw stones. I assure you, I've, I've had ignorance and, and still will will always have that. But in, in regard to that, this immediacy that people are looking for in their craft, they want to learn how to photograph overnight. They think there's a piece of gear, they think whatever. And, and yet I talk about vocabulary, I talk about language, and we think about it in our own personal development as a culture and whatnot, and that's totally ridiculous. Well, it, to me, it's just as ridiculous in the arts as it is uh, elsewhere. Right. I mean, photography has been branded as a form of communication. I don't know about you, but I have not mastered communication in any by any means. You know, I'm working on that all the time with, you know, friendships, relationships, family. I have 13 nieces and nephews. The oldest one is soon to be 10. I have been around the, the process of them growing up and seeing that. And uh, it's really interesting watching them communicate and the different levels that they're at on varying ages. I, I feel I understand, you know. This vocabulary idea, that aha moment of connecting those two makes total sense, uh, you know, and it relates back to the original thing you said that it's a performance art, you know, which is also big with vocabulary and music talking about phrasing. Well, we have to have that be captured in an image. So I think that fits well. Well, in, in regard to that, and, and not to belabor the point, I can't imagine reading poetry from a poet that has never read poetry. I can't imagine reading a novel from a novelist that's never read a novel. 
And yet we're around photographers that don't look at photography. And what I mean by that is they may look at Facebook, they may look at whatever, but there's a very, very, very narrow view of of what people are looking at. And I have an expression, which is that a camera is a box with a hole in it. That sounds so simplified and so stupid. And to be honest, it's meant to be simplified and stupid. But if a camera is just a box with a hole in it, why do we always point it at the same stuff? You can point a box with a hole in it at virtually anything. There's a whole world of photographs. What we're able to do with photography, we haven't even scratched the surface. And yet people have a very, very, very narrow scope of what's actually out there. The path to growth is just in that experience to actively seek out photography, image making, art, architecture, so forth and so on. It just keeps going and going and going where we can get those influences. I would encourage people, again, if you're going to write, read, 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 read. They always say the best writers are the best readers, right? Right. Well, perhaps the best photographers are the best, uh, the best viewers. I like that. Moving on here, uh, just so we don't get too caught up in these moments here. Have you found in your career so far uh, an I made it moment? You know, something that just really let you know that you were on the right path and it was validated in some regard. You know, you, you, you feel you made it. Can you bring us to that time in your life? In hindsight, it's a little embarrassing. When I opened my first studio, I had these uh, walls in, in the shooting space that were basically empty. And I'd been trying, it was a, a fairly decent sized studio, and I'd been trying to, uh, you know, for, for PPA people or other people that have done uh, competitions and whatnot, I'd tried to merit an image. I'd tried to get an image accepted into a collection. Right. And I had failed for a year. I got my first merit. And so I framed it, put it on the wall, put the ribbon on it, hung it up there, and then left the rest of the walls blank. And the reason I did it is people looked up and they thought, oh, congratulations on the award. That's not what I saw. What I saw was I have now started something and the rest of the walls are blank and I need to fill those. So I guess the I made it part was not that I had finished something, is that I had finally started something. Very nice. And then after a while, I ran out of space, which, you know, again, not with arrogance or anything like that. But what drove me was looking up there and seeing these bare walls and it really hacked me off. Right. Do you recall the competition, the, the first merit that you received of where that came from? Sure. It was, uh, well, I mean, the, the first one was at the Professional Photographers Association in Northern Illinois. And then it went on to the state uh, state convention, won a Kodak Gallery Award, and then went on and, and made the general collection for PPA. Oh, and it was, cool. a, it was a wedding shot. The uh, The title of it was kind of funny because I'd gotten real, I, I don't like titling stuff. I've gotten pretty decent at it. I, it was a wedding couple and it was called A Kiss in the Trees. So it was always funny to see that in print because in in frustration it was just my way of kind of being a little bit belligerent like hey <laughs> they're kissing in the trees <laughs> as if we couldn't tell so yeah, but ex awesome. exactly well we're getting down to the wire here so we're going to speed things up a little bit and i'm just going to get through these questions and you can deliver a nice fast track answer here michael during your photography career so far what is the best advice you have ever received practice 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 Practice, practice, practice. It's simple, it's smart, and it's very relevant. So Photo World, get out there. Practice. Learn your craft by doing your craft. If you had to start your photography all over, I'm allowing that you have the same gear and knowledge that you have today, but your business just doesn't exist tomorrow. You wake up, what's the first thing you do with this new business? Jump for joy? <laughs> <laughs> Finally got a break. <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, walk away from the big stack of tax stuff and paperwork. Um, <laughs> what's the first thing I do? Practice, practice, practice? Yeah, for sure. I like it. Well, and, and I, I guess what I would do differently is I, I want to, and it's hard to say because everything I did brings me, brings me to where I am, but I want to be as constricted to what people told me I could do or what I couldn't do. No, that's a good point. It just adds up and makes sense, you know, practicing and just getting away from any limitations by settling, you know, uh, at a certain area. So, well, you know, I, I started out like other people. I guess I got myself in a bit of trouble here and there for being unconventional. <laughs> and these days I get rewarded because I'm unconventional. 
Well, it's good. Do you have an app or an internet resource that you could share with Photo World that maybe they could also benefit from knowing about? Google. Google. <laughs> mentor of mine and friend of mine, he'll be really embarrassed if he hears the word mentor, but uh, Tom Rouse, who's a brilliant photographer out in DeKalb. And uh, you spell Tom with an H, so it's T-H-O-M-R-O-U-S-E. Uh, and with Tom, uh, he's the one that kind of hit me to Google. And of course, we all, I have to say just about everyone knows about Google. If not, well, hey, welcome to the world of Epiphany. Yeah. But he... he <laughs> has been around to a lot of museums, a lot of galleries, a lot of whatever. And his comment was, and I would agree, there's nothing like seeing a piece with your own eyes. There's nothing like seeing a print. However, most of us can't jet set around the world and see every great work that's ever been created. Right. But you can spend an hour in Google and see a countless number of images and check out a glimpse of countless photographers. And so going through there and going through Google Images and setting a little time aside just to explore photography, to me, I think is ginormous. Yeah, for sure. And just to expand a little bit for those of you who may not have a Gmail account or be, be on it, Google Drive is an amazing resource. Well, let me throw this out there too. This is something that I'm in the practice of doing, but uh, one of the first things that just about anyone out there does, uh, you know, certainly people that are savvy enough to listen to podcasts are, are probably going to do this is we get up in the morning, we check our email, right? Right. And one of the last things we do before we go to sleep is forget to do something, right? <laughs> yeah. So what do I do? I email myself at night, the morning, I check my email, I get a little message from myself of reminders of what to do the next day. I like that. It's amazing how much more productivity I get out of doing something just as simple as that. And many, many countless amounts of entrepreneurs and business uh, owners would tell you, you know, create a daily list and know what you have to accomplish. And if you're doing that at the end of the night, emailing yourself, it's right in the place you usually start anyway. So I really like that practice. Michael, what is the one piece of gear you could just not live without? My 85 millimeter. 85 a brilliant portrait lens and a, a beautiful aperture in most cases, right? Yep. I shoot so. with an 85 1.2 on my Canon. Oh, man. There's a lot of people that don't like that lens, but there's also a lot of people that misuse that lens in fairness. Mm -hmm. But to me, going back from a while ago, talking about playing a Steinway versus playing a synthesizer or playing a keyboard or something, that piano has a... Or not piano. I'm sorry. Rather... <laughs> lens that lens yes <laughs> has a uh has a feel to it it has a, a quality it has an aesthetic and it's not a perfect aesthetic to me just the weight of it the way it feels is is so important to what i'm doing even the way it balances on my camera so more to the story than just the aperture so i like that usually you don't hear that often it's always just oh it's super fast well what's interesting with that lens as a side note is that lens actually gets returned a lot because people say it's not sharp right well, the reason it's not sharp, kind of got to know what you're doing. I'll say that quietly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Michael, we're getting to the end here. And could you, before we go, share with Photo World one parting piece of guidance, the best way we can find and follow you online or social media, and then we'll say goodbye. Oh, parting words. Pay attention. It's around you. It's there. Open your eyes. Your brain is already trained to do everything that you need it to do. Couple that with practice and it will take you places that you can't even imagine. Don't accept it when people tell you that you can't do things and you just might do things that they say you can't do. As far as where to find me, uh, just michaelbartonart.com. I also have an education site, do a lot of workshops, do all sorts of different stuff with that private lesson a little plug there, but that's michaelbarteneducation.com. And how could I be anything without Facebook? So you can find me on Facebook, Michael Barton Art on Facebook. Very nice. And Photo World, you know this. A reminder for sure on takingtalkpicks.com, we will have in the show notes page for Michael Barton the links here, the resources we talked about, and a brief overview of our conversation. Uh, so be sure to check out there, and you'll have direct links back to his work and workshop opportunities. Uh, and I definitely encourage that. Michael, I can't thank you enough for being here and sharing such great value. Photo World thanks you, and happy shooting. Yeah, thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure.
Hey Photo World, are you loving take and talk pics? Maybe you are starting out or wanting to refine your skills in a new area of your photography. Like I say on the show, we are always learning, and that learning doesn't have to stop. At the College of DuPage, their photography program is amazing. I should know. I'm a former student, and now I'm an instructor at the school. Visit cod.edu forward slash photo for more information on their program. Not local to the Chicago area? That's okay. The College of DuPage photography program is now offering online courses. Just check the course catalog for what fits your schedule. Again, that's cod dot edu slash photo for more information photo world are you getting great resources from take and talk picks podcast head to the website take and talk picks.com from there please click on the itunes button that'll bring you to itunes podcast page for take and talk picks i would love to see your support and five star rating also please subscribe at take and talk for a chance to win an itunes gift card